Hello, everyone, and welcome to the COGX 2020 track for next generation infrastructure and cloud services. Now, COGX is probably one of the largest virtual events of its kind since the start of the pandemic. So it's great to have you join us from wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Russ Shaw. I am the founder of Tech London Advocates and Global Tech Advocates. These are communities of tech leaders coming together, all as volunteers, to support local and regional tech ecosystems. Across the Advocates Network, we have many working groups focused on areas relating to next-gen infrastructure, including 5G, robotics, digital manufacturing, IoT, AI and data, and smart cities. And in my role uh, leading Global Tech Advocates, I'm currently talking to IT leaders across Europe, the US and China about their views and visions for the post-pandemic world that we are entering and the infrastructure that will be needed now and going forward. So I'm delighted to be your MC and host for today's sessions. Now we will have five sessions over the next eight hours on this very important topic. Today, we're going to cover themes relating to digital twins, smart robotics, the cloud data, and smart cities, and how cities are adapting to their hyper acceleration towards digitization. Now, as we get ready, I'd like to give a shout out to Microsoft, who are the headline sponsor for COGX and have helped to make this event possible. And you'll hear from three leaders from Microsoft in one of our sessions today. Now, it would be great to have you share what you're experiencing today on social media. The Twitter tag is hashtag COGX2020. And please get comfortable. Move around as you listen. Go for a socially distanced walk with your headphones. Browse the COGX Expo. There's going to be some fantastic content coming your way. So please absorb and enjoy and feel free uh, to ask questions during the Q&A session. So, okay, let's go to our first, uh, first session, which is focused on digital, uh, digital twins in a crisis. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, to open up a fireside chat, which features Paul Clark, the Chief Technology Officer of Avocado, and David Lane, founder and director of the Edinburgh Center for Robotics. So David, over to you to begin a fireside chat and welcome everyone. So thank you, Russ, and hello, everybody, wherever you are uh, in the world. I'm uh, David Lane, and as Russ kindly pointed out, I'm a director of the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics, which is a joint venture between two universities in Edinburgh, Herrick Watt and uh, Edinburgh University. Uh, and we have lots of PhD students and lots of research going on in robotics and AI for a variety uh, of applications. But I'm also somebody who's spent quite a lot of time building businesses. I've not always been an academic. Um, uh, and so I've had a wealth of experience, which has put me in a place where I've got some things to say about what I think we could and should have been doing with robotics and digital twins and, and AI and what the future looks like and what we should be doing about it now, I think. But this is a fireside chat. And so I'm going to hand over also to let my colleague and friend and Somebody I see almost as much as my family uh, over Zoom, though, <laughs> recent weeks and some of the work we've been doing together, uh, Paul Clark from Acada. And let Paul introduce himself and say a few words to get us going. Paul. Thank you, David. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to COGX. And uh, yes, my name's Paul Clark. I'm uh, Chief uh, Technology Officer at Acado. Um, I've been doing that for the last 14 years. And um, under the surface, we, we do a huge amount with robotics and AI and machine learning, but also with digital twins um, and other synthetic environments. And uh, so like David, I have uh, deep passion on those topics and uh, what uh, uh, they uh, uh, can and will do for us. Um, and uh, you know, that's really what we're gonna be talking about uh, today. Um, uh, you know, what the smart machines you know, um, could have done for us. Uh, but I'm gonna hand back to David now, who I think is gonna get us started. Right. So may maybe what we should do to kick off, Paul, how about this? Why don't we say a bit about what it was, what it was we did in our journeys, because we've had separate journeys, but they've been the same in different ways, about the way we gave birth to the robots and the AI systems that we use. You know, and, um, you know, and I think, why, why don't you kick off, because Ocado, fabulous com company, and the, the, the revolution that you've brought about, 
in your time there as a CTO. And the way that's changed the online grocery business is all around the world is, is enormous. And it's used robotics and AI to do it. And it's been under your leadership that that's happened. So why don't you talk a little bit about the, the journey and the sort of stages of everything that you went through in order to m give birth to those robots? Sure. So uh, one of the first things um, that I did when I joined Ocado, um just over 14 years ago uh, was to start um, hiring um, what became our simulation team and our simulation department and and this deep core competence that fuels so much of what we do. Uh, because um, when you're building complex, you know, ecosystems uh, with robots and and other smart machines and all powered by AI and ML, that's an enormous amount of complexity and data. And, you know, you can't just throw it together and hope it works. So, um, you know, in those days we were building, you know, our first generation warehouses, which are full of, you know, miles and miles of conveyors and thousands of plastic crates whizzing around. But there was still a lot of complexity there. Um, and uh, so we set about, you know, acquiring this capability to build simulations. Um, those then moved on to become higher fidelity emulations where we could actually run the production software that we were writing, you know, on those emulations. And, and uh, then we would visualize all the data and the learnings coming from those models um, uh, and allow, you know, our engineers to uh, zoom in and, and, and watch any part at any time and play back and play forwards and so forth. Uh, and then over time, they evolved into proper digital twins. Um, and that's a term that, you know, is, is much misused, unfortunately. It means many different things to different people. But to us, it means conjoining these high fidelity simulations and models um, uh, in both directions, taking all the data from the real world into the models, using it to optimize the settings, which you then feed back into the, the real time control systems. And then over time, you know, the robot, the rise of the robots started happening and, and more and more of the hard automation was replaced uh, uh, with, uh, with robots. And now, you know, our latest generation warehouses, which we're building sort of 40 of um, around the world over the next four years for our, our platform customers, you know, each of them containing, you know, perhaps 3,000 uh, of these swarming robots, you know, and each of those facilities has to be modeled, you know, in these, these synthetic environments and, you need to put perhaps a year's worth of your customer's data through because everybody's you know, uh, data is different and you need to optimize those warehouses for a particular customer. Um, so it is this uh, stitching together of the physical and the digital worlds that really uh, allows us to do certainly you know, what we do. But I think, David, you've had a similar journey, haven't you, albeit in an uh, academic environment? Yeah, and, and businesses as well. I built a business uh, many years ago, it's still going strong, called C-Byte, spelled S-E-E, and -E, B-Y-T-E. -E. And we were building autonomous underwater vehicles for navies and for the oil and gas industry and for offshore wind to do surveys and do stuff in the ocean. Uh, and um, it was at a time 20 years before self-driving cars. So there was no autonomy stacks around that you could go and, and companies to do it. We were sort of making it up as we went on. And because these robots are working in the ocean, you know, it's quite difficult to do experiments with them for real because, you know, you have to be on the ocean on a boat, very expensive, and, and time is money when you're out there. And so of necessity, we had to do very similar things. We had to simulate the robots. We had to simulate the environment around them. And then to actually transition from simulation to real systems, we had to have um, hardware in the loop, we called it at the time, but emulation facilities so that we could sort of slowly unplug the simulations around the real flight code for the robot uh, and plug in real sensors, real hardware, and then get to the point where we maybe had something working in a test tank or we had it working um, maybe on a dock side. And that meant that Eventually, when we got out to go to sea to do stuff for real, we knew to some extent it worked, and we weren't sort of debugging really early software problems, you know, at sea where it's just you know difficult and expensive and, and, and everything. So, what we learned from that was the real power of simulation, emulation, digital twin in in the work that we did, and we always found that you know we in, in order to reliability was hugely important to us because if, you know 
th th these robots are off for sort of seven, eight hours at a time. And if it goes wrong, right, you, just, you don't know about it, or you might not know about it for, for quite a long time. So we had to test, 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 test uh, to make sure that everything worked. And so we, we do that in simulation. We do that with, you know, we leave things for weeks, flight code running for weeks with simulations in order to make sure that, uh, that everything worked. So it was that process of going through simulation, emulation, digital twin, living lab, uh, so we're into a sort of realistic environment and then out to the real world. That was absolutely fundamental for us to be able to do anything and build anything reliable that could work in the ocean. So that's huge. So so we had a similar journey, right? And here yeah. we are. Um, uh, so what, here's, here's one, Paul. Let's, let's turn, let's turn the, the gain up a bit. What's really frustrated you about the current situation with the pandemic apart from the obvious things you know about you know people dying and all that you know but what what's what's really given you some angst that's got you your blood boiling crikey uh you know me too well um i think um uh you know there's there's so much more you know that we could have done both in the physical uh, world you know with smart machines and indeed in the digital world um and you know uh, you know, for, you know, you and I often, you know, uh, meet in those two worlds, both because of, you know, uh, the fact that we co-chair the Robotics Growth Partnership, but also we we both sit on the AI Council. And I think that's the powerful thing is where those two worlds come together, as I was saying earlier. And I think there is so much more that we 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 could have done, you know, with smart machines, whether that be, you know, I don't know, uh, modular reconfigurable production lines that you know uh, could have with greater agility you know, produce scarce resources that we needed, you know, whether that be, I don't know, drugs or PPE or whatever, or, you know, smart machines that could have gone into hazardous environments and and uh, helped keep humans, you know, safer, whether that be, you know, hospitals to deliver supplies or pick up samples or monitor patients or do cleaning or whatever it is. or And, and then, of course, you know, in terms of the world that we know well in Ocado, the whole kind of supply chain and last mile, you know the role that you know autonomous delivery vehicles and drones, uh, VTOL aircraft, other kinds of smart machines could have you could have be, uh, been employed to deliver all sorts of kind of atoms, if you like, around more scalably and and sus sustainably and and indeed with greater resilience. Um, and I think it's so. I think it's the fact that you know there's there's more that we could have done to prepare for that. You know, um, and now we must do that going forwards. Um, but also, I think it's about the uh, reframing our view of what infrastructure is. You know, um, there's lots of physical infrastructure we take for, uh, you know, for granted around us. But there's there's other kinds of more hidden digital infrastructure that can help us. And I think you know, you and I have both been talking about the infrastructure to support that kind of gestation and growth cycle, if you like, of of smart machines, right from you know. Uh, how they're born in simulation all the way through to living labs, which, uh, like you, we we make deep use of, you know, at Ocado. So um, maybe uh, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, that, that kind of digital infrastructure and what it could have done for us, because I know we we both feel uh, uh, we could have been more on the front foot with that. We could. <clears throat> I can tell you, I can tell you what's made my blood boil. <clears throat> Excuse me for coughing, everybody. <clears throat> um, I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. And I got back in, I think it was April, and so it's all happening, right, I'm a lockdown. I got contacted by the Scottish Government COVID-19 Committee, and they said to me, uh, uh, we've got an issue trying to clean our hospitals. Can you give a Centre for Robotics, right? Can you provide us or help us get some robots to clean our hospitals using ultraviolet light was the, uh, was the answer. So I went around all my colleagues, I remember we're all locked down and we're not able to get into the labs and do anything you know and we all had a chat about it over zoom and email and everything else and what we came up with was that maybe in six months we could put something together to help the problem that was happening that week in the scottish hospitals and we had to say you know you might be able to buy some robots from the us or china or uh, scandinavia uh, that could do some of this if the, if there's a supply, but I imagine they're in quite high demand. But our ability to take the things we know how to do, we know how to 
build mobile robots. We've got some in prototypes in the lab. We've got legged robots that walk around. You know, we're, we're doing, in some of the research programs we've got, Orca Hub, I'll give it a plug, uh, orcahub.org, everybody, if you want to find out for uh, robots in hazardous environments on offshore platforms and offshore energy uh, uh, assets. You know, we're, we're researching a lot of the techniques to do this kind of stuff, but we don't have anything ready to go that can go into a hospital and do real work. And to your point, Paul, about digital infrastructure, we didn't have the tools that would allow us all to work together to start to realize some of that, to design systems, to prototype them, to get some of the smart software working. We could do some things, some of the tools we use, um, but like Ross, for example, but um, it, it wasn't uh, sufficiently joined up. And that's a problem. You know, when we weren't able to respond well in the, in the current, with, the, with the tools that we had. So we, there's a pressing need there. Shall I talk about the ventilator challenge as well? Maybe I should give that one a plug. Um, uh, meanwhile, we were <clears throat> watching with interest how UK was trying to respond to, at that point, there was a big worry about would we have enough ventilators, you know, because we didn't know how the, how the, uh, the, the pandemic was going to progress. And what, the story we did hear about that was just great was the way that uh, uh, the high value manufacturing catapult, I'll give them a plug, and companies, a variety of companies in the UK and other academic institutions came together and designed, built, certified, manufactured, and delivered a ventilator to the NHS and nobody pretty much met anybody. It was all done remotely. And they had enough of the software tools um, to be able to do that. Wow. Okay, so it's it's mainly sort of mechanical engineering and you know the the in the manufacturing world, those those kind of tools have been around for a while. But in the robot and AI world, they don't exist. We don't have the tools that we can use to work together remotely. But whether in response to a pandemic pandemic or or any other forcing function uh, it could be it could be economic even or it could be environmental there's a whole variety of things that you might want reasons you might want to be able to be more resilient in your ability to respond um, and we weren't and and it was hugely frustrating to me so the kind of what am i doing or what are we doing in in our response to what we're learning and the, the new normal that we're going to come back to. The, and, and I think what some people have started to call the low touch economy that we're, that we're looking at in the future is trying to figure out how it is that we can take the fantastic uh, skills and talent we have certainly in the UK, in our universities, with our researchers, in our companies, large companies, small companies, startups, SMEs, catapults and get everybody working together better to be able to be more resilient be more responsive to these kinds of uh, circumstances would that be right paul have i got that right yeah. what do you think I, I think it's absolutely right i mean as you as you say these these capabilities exist i mean i know that you've been using uh, these kind of environments um within the uh, robotic hubs of which orca is one um, and indeed you know when lockdown hit at Ocado, you know all of our researchers and Innovator certainly in my division, you know, headed home, you know, um, to use the simulation environments that we have. Um, mm -hmm. They took some 3D printers with them and other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But the point is, you know, those sim those synthetic environments that we use enabled us to kind of keep going, allowed the research and the innovation uh, to keep going. And um, so we were we were lucky there, but you know, not not everybody has access to these you know the the, the bar to uh, uh, getting you know to being able to build these kinds of uh, models and these environments you know it's set too high at the moment and I think that's the thing that really uh, you and I both feel very strongly about is we need to lower that bar to make this much more of a commodity that's available to startups and researchers and SMEs and really um, anybody who needs to use them but also that they're way more kind of collaborative and they're a shared resource so that um, everybody's kind of as much as possible within the same environment so that you can put together, you know, coalitions um, and uh, and get people, you know, working 
uh, clever together. And I love I love the phrase that I remember using the other day um, about you know how this has been an exercise in sort of simulated annealing. You know, and I think we've been through this process of of mm -hmm. kind of um, uh, of and, and we are going to settle out, as you say, in a new kind of uh, a new um, energy state, if you like, at the end of it, uh, as part of this low touch economy. Um, and I think, um, you know, fundamental to building, you know, this shared, more accessible environment um, is the, this kind of glue, this smart glue that we talk about, the commons that allows us to stitch together these models, both kind of horizontally and vertically. You know, you want to combine models from different domains, but you also need uh, vertically to have models with different levels of, of fidelity and, and abstraction. So for example, you know, um, one of the other worlds uh, I'm involved in is, is the Future Flight Industrial Strategy Program. And, and there, you know, you might be combining, you know, a model of a uh, of an engine in an aircraft or an electric aircraft with the uh, model of the aircraft itself. Uh, then you perhaps want that to sit within a model of the air traffic control system. And over time, you want to build a, a, a high fidelity model of the complete, you know, aerospace sector. And all those different pieces have to be built by different people. The different models need to be different, by, built by different people. They're probably built with different technologies, but you still uh, got to be able to find a way to glue them together so that they can talk to one another um, either directly or through kind of uh, data marts. And so um, this glue um, that we need to build, these commons, is core to this idea of building the shared um, the shared infrastructure. And um, and it it is a fractal like pattern because wherever you go. You know, people are off building their kind of complex systems and wanting to model them. And they think that their world, you know, represents, you know, the whole territory. And, they, you know, uh, maybe we can have a bit of glue in our area and they'll be, you know, that will be fantastic. But what perhaps they sometimes lose sight of is the fact that their world is just, you know, one planet in a much bigger solar system. And, and, and in fact, all over the place, we want to be using the same kind of commons and smart glue to make sure that, you know, we can work together uh, so I work separately, but then bring the what we're producing together and and create more powerful solutions. So um, we've got another idea, haven't we? Which is all around how, as well as the commercial offerings, we might uh, do something exciting from an open source perspective. We do, and I love in, so because <clears throat> we have looked around at you know what exists out there. I, but I love your phrase that you used that. The, this digital infrastructure that we talk about, it's like the internet because it's used by everybody but owned by nobody. I think that's a great phrase. And I credit you with that, absolutely. Um, and when we've looked around at what tools are already out there, there are some sort of commercially available ones, but they don't quite do what we need, right? And, and so, um, and also they're commercial, and, and that means that they're not... Um, necessarily available to everybody because there's a commercial transaction around that. And the open source movement is a very important one that's given us great things, you know, the Linux operating system, for example, you know, and there are, there are many others as well. So I think we, it's fair to say we have a vision that we can bring some of this digital commons, some of this, we've called it digital tissue in the past, we're still working on the name, aren't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, in, uh, that can allow us to connect together all these different um, digital twins, modeling tools, um, uh, pieces of smart software, machine learning tools, you know, together to, in, into a more integrated whole. So that, you know, on a Monday morning, you know, people can log in from wherever they are and start working together on developing systems and they can do it in, a, in an agile way and at pace if necessary. So I guess that's the mission we're on, is how we're going to go about making that happen, right? Yeah. In our, in our work, at, work at the moment. Um, so uh, yeah, it's going, to, it's, it's going to take some time. I think maybe, would this be a good time to see if uh, Sabine is there yeah. and bring her, because we're, we're, we're cracking through the time here. We haven't really said hello to Sabine yet. So we're, it's great to have Sabine Hart here from uh, uh, the Bristol Robotics Lab, uh, Professor Scott and she's um, I hope been able to monitor the chat I'm not sure if that's been working or not to see if we can get any feedback from everybody out there about uh, what people are saying Sabine are you managing to connect with anything much or 
So just a couple of thoughts. This has been a fascinating discussion, and you can see how these synthetic environments and digital commons would be really empowering for people who might want to, to develop robotics, whether they're SMEs or industries or, or everyday users. But I also heard the word complexity very often. And so I wonder if there was a tangible um, example, may, maybe the disinfecting robots, where you can walk people through what this might feel like uh, for them using such a digital a digital common. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm happy to have a go at that. I mean, we, um, this is this is certainly, you know, core to our, our use of, um, of these uh, environments, because um, you know, you, you can start building quite simple models, of, you know, of a new area, and then over time, you know, you overlay more complexity, you know, to make your model higher and higher fidelity, and and that's an incremental process. But you get value all the way along. You know, it's not like you have to sort of uh, uh, produce this incredibly complex high fidelity model right on day one. But you have to also realize that you know. Um, if you start making predictions before you've added enough sophistication, you know the answers you get may not be quite right because you've probably missed out some edge, you know, some edge cases or some exception conditions or whatever. But I think one of the most exciting, um, and I remember talking about this at Cogex last year, applications of these models is when you start attaching machine learning and AI to these models. Because I think one of the other things that these environments do is they allow AI and machine learning to get physical, if you like. They allow um, um, uh, these these digital technologies in terms of AI machine learning to be connected uh, with a representation of the physical world that lets them start exploring it. But it also allows you to use uh, machine learning to manage complexity that is, you know, beyond human scale. So, I mean, an example in our backyard is that, you know, each of these warehouses we're building now, you know, 3,000 robots, each robot 5,000 data points, 1,000 times a second. That's a, you know, a gigabyte of robot per, per robot per day of data or about four terabytes per swarm per day. Now, you human engineers just can't manage that kind of complexity in real time, but machine learning can. And, and what's more, you need something to scale across uh, you know, many warehouses in our case. And I think this is part of the challenge we face going forwards is how to build scalability and resilience by design in the same way that people talk about building security by design. We've not, we need to think of this not as an afterthought, but right from the start about how we're going to use these technologies to manage this very complex world, whether it be responding to a crisis like the current one or other really big problems, you know, like climate change that we face where the complexity is huge, you know, and it's such a big toothpaste tube. And you st if you start squeezing it without understanding the implications of the changes you make, because you don't have a model, then you may create all sorts of unintended consequences. David, what about what about you? What are the examples of complexity in your world? Well, I wondered uh, if be oh. complexified actually, because I think the complexity, <clears throat> I think the complexity is is the vision. But I also wonder if these tools could be useful for entry-level robotics. So so these disinfectants, right. it feels like they should be there. Uh, and yet, as you said, they aren't. Uh, so how, how would this also help bootstrap those types of, of yeah. scenarios? So I, I, so one of the things that you put in a digital twin is the sort of workflows about how people do things, right? And that can be how the users do it. But it could also be the sort of how you, how you develop stuff, which is kind of what you're asking, I think. So. Um, what will it feel like? And to me, I think this lends itself very much to the sort of agile development methodology. I mean, you can use the traditional, you know, waterfall, whatever approach. But the, what this allows you to do is to develop systems in simulation to start with, um, uh, using agile methods where a series of sprints and you, you realize capability successively and you do the sort of optimization that Paul was talking about, you know, as you go. And you get to some point in simulation where you go, okay, that's that's enough. That's kind of working well enough now that I, I need to get into the real world because the simulation is not perfect. It's not really like the real world. And the machine learning that you might have used on the simulation, when you put it in the real world, it won't have learned the right things, right? So you need to go learn in the real, in the real world. Um, and so uh, you move away from the digital twin at that point into, you know, a living lab, an environment where you've got, you know, real robot platforms running around, uh, but it's safe. So, uh, you know, if it goes wrong, it, it might damage the robot, but it won't damage anybody and it won't cause any problem. 
so and you then kind of repeat that kind of agile thing in the, in the you know in the living lab and I, and that, so I see, I see a series of those agile workflows and you know and I think it's something that I mean you're right it, it's you want it to be accessible to um, how shall I call it um, low cost tech as opposed to very expensive tech and I think and and certainly you know Acado you know, had reasonably deep pockets in order to develop what it did, but it had to develop everything itself, right? And and you can look at other companies like Amazon, you know, when, when they've developed their fulfillment warehouses, probably the same. Um, and I think the, the power of this is that if it's a digital commons and it's open and it's accessible to everybody, then you don't have to reinvent the wheel and do it all yourself. There's other stuff out there that you can reach out to and use and be part of. So, so everybody who's engaged in this is inside the tent, not outside. And you know, if you know, and if we certainly think of this as not being a huge IT project that is going to take you know dozens of years to complete and will never work. You know, it's something that actually boils down to um, some APIs, some middleware, um, and the ability to interface things that already exist. So, in the spirit of digital commons and openness. You know, it's to some extent, it's about who's prepared to provide an API to their stuff, whatever stuff is, um, in order that things can connect together. And we're trying to build a coalition of the willing to start with about people who are prepared to do that so that we can do the sort of V1 prototyping of it and, and get the idea uh, off the ground. And, and do exactly what you're saying, Sabine, which is show how to do it around some simple, some relatively simple applications, not very expensive, but agile and quick to deliver results. Okay, great. We have a little question here from uh, Ben Butterworth. Uh, so he's asking, I've been to Amazon Robotics and Okada Robotics talks. Uh, the difference is Okada has more sophisticated tech. Um, any thoughts? <laughs> so this is something from the crowd. And it, it goes to what David was just saying uh, uh, about having to develop things from the ground up for a specific purpose, I think. Maybe I mean, I, well, no, I, 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 maybe obliquely, which is you're right. We we do build pretty much everything ourselves, and we're very self-sufficient. But we're also very aware of those areas where we have to do what David's just been saying, where it is about working, you know, with others and open standards and so forth. And you know, a, a great example of that is around kind of you know autonomous vehicles and 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 autonomous delivery vehicles, or whatever. And and one of those living labs that we've been mentioning, you know, we're in, in the process of building one. You know, in Hertfordshire, around you know this intersection of autonomous vehicles, drones, robots, smart infrastructure, and smart services, because it is a a properly big ecosystem that you need to construct there uh, if you want to deliver stuff scalably. You know, with automation, uh, with autonomous vehicles of all different kinds of sizes and on the land and in the air and so forth. And and as David says, you can only go so far in digital twins, and then you start need when you want to learn about things like public adoption and privacy and things like that. You need to get out there but you need to do it in a constrained environment and i think um you know we've had to pause that slightly because uh, you know uh we can't stop we can't be doing things in the outside world that much but we'll be picking that up again hopefully soon um but it is a fundamentally important part and it's a bit like you know it's a bit like children you know they start off in kindergarten and then they go to school and then you know uh, uh and then they go to secondary school and then you know as parents you start kind of letting them out you know but you can you know be back at 11 o'clock or whatever right? and then eventually they leave home and then you need to still be have a way to provide support and that's where perhaps the last thing we haven't mentioned i think comes in which is this ability to put humans back into the loop safely you know with things like teleoperation and haptics and that's that's kind of going to be important um, in those environments where smart machines go, but they may get stuck. You know, like a cleaning robot may get itself into a corner behind something, and 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 you want humans to be able to get back in and go, kind of, okay, all right, you know, I'll get you out of that mess. And and in so doing, the humans hopefully provide some additional learning that helps the robot, you know, over time acquire you know new tricks, so that maybe you know you have to intervene less and less and i think that's just like the final stage of of helping these smart machines mature um but the only way they're going to be around when we need them you know like now um is if they're woven as i put it into the, the kind of the fabric of everyday life and then you know then they're there to be used for other purposes so um i think going forwards it is this combination of of um you know 
adding more smart machines to our everyday lives, but also the synthetic environment and the infrastructure to support it. Um, but and then but some of that has also ways it can help humans. So for example, you know, humans can learn, you know, in these synthetic environments. David, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, certainly we've 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 found uh, synthetic environments to be um, essential, as we've said, to do to do the, the, the sort of system, the system development. I think it's fair to say that the, the like I said it already, the learning that we've done in those environments, the machine learning, um, we've got some pretty rude shocks when we took it, having machine learned something around sensor data from a you know in a synthetic environment, you know, and trying to recognise things and characterise things, you know, in in uh, synthetic data. When we put it into the real world with real noise and uh, everything else and delays and, and all sorts of sort of standard systems engineering issues, you know, uh, and the real world isn't like the synthetic world. The, world. the synthetic world only models the things that you put into it and not the things you don't know about. You don't know what you don't know right, about the real world. Or, you, or the physics is just too hard. Then um, there's a real learning journey there. So, that, and that's why living labs are, are, are we've seen are yeah. uh, uh, essential. Um, well, I was thinking about skills, you know, I mean, if you think about well, kind know, of the environments yeah. where, um, you yeah. know, uh, which, you know, my children certainly, you know, uh, when they were younger, you know, uh, used to immerse themselves in very high fidelity, imaginary virtual worlds, but which actually yeah. have were, you know, fantastic sort of physics engines. And they, they were very uh, representative of the real world, although they allowed you to do some things that probably you would get arrested for if you did them in the real world. But the point is, you know, that leads to kind of ways in which people can learn in these immersive environments and acquire new skills without having to necessarily have access. Is that is that right? Yeah, sure, and and that kind of training element is something that you know organ other organisations have done you know uh, uh, a lot, and it's and it's a huge value as long as you realise that the real world might not be quite like this, 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 the the I mean, airline pilots do, for example. But you still have to go and do you know time on a real aeroplane to uh, you know to, to certify. You can't do it all in simulation. I think skills. We're, we're getting close to running out of time here. I think skills is something we haven't said very much about. But I think it's worth noting that we recognise that's going to be a huge area of development, um, where you know, in universities, in our technical colleges, for apprentices, you know, there, there's a real need to get good, uh, particularly in the technical colleges, actually. So that if we have you know these smart machines, you know, there's plenty of jobs for everybody keeping them all going right they're not all going to self self fix themselves and so part of the thing that we're doing in the robotics growth partnership is thinking about what should that be and how would you know we be able to provide um the opportunities for people in apprentices and otherwise to acquire the skills they need to be part of that and and i think it's it's a huge part of how does the uk move forward you know coming out of the pandemic into the future um, and you know, there's, we're in a recession. You know, traditionally in recessions, it's a good time for universities normally because everyone goes back to study a course, you know, to learn to upskill themselves. And I think we need to be on the front foot about that, about how we um, uh, think about the provision that we've got in order that people have those opportunities. I, I see there's a question about data. Yeah. I'd love to have a go at that because I think that's another, you know, incredibly important. Uh, uh, ingredient in this kind of cauldron that we're cooking with both in the ai kind of world obviously but also you know for uh, robotics and particularly to feed these these models and um you know one of the challenges we face is that at the moment we lack the sufficiently uh mature um ways of um uh, controlling if you like the flow of digital assets whether that be data or these digital twins or maps or other kinds of other kinds of digital assets and you know um as, as we were saying earlier david people will be happy to contribute you know um uh some of their their kind of uh, goodies if you like you know into the mix but only if they kind of know what they're going to be used for and by whom you know for what purposes so really really important and that's that's also been very important you know, obviously, COGX is a you know AI focused conference. You know, with our other hats on, you know, in the in the AI world, you know, we could have done much more with AI in this uh, crisis if if you know we'd had better ways to um, share data, 
you know, safely and reliable. And obviously that's something we're working on. So it will benefit both of these worlds to have those kind of uh, that better d digital asset management techniques, whether it be passports or data trusts or whatever, um, because uh, uh, that's that is really as people often talk about it being the new oil but it is the oil that oils the machines and the uh, the digital twins mm -hmm. i thought it would be nice maybe to close up to think uh, back at your term the low touch economy and new normal and maybe what this could what this could look like in the future mm. um i'll have a go at that um some things that have sort of a pennies dropped with me you know the uh We've only ever got rid of two viruses ever. Smallpox is one of them. Um, the other is, I can't remember the name, it's in cattle. Everything else is still out there. SARS, AIDS, you know, so the virus is here. It's, you know, and we might get a vaccine, but that's, you know, back, think about flu. You know, it, it, it takes time. And what we don't want to have is a vaccine that everybody uses that turns out to be flawed somewhere down the line. Think of how much worse. You know, the cure would be better than the than the illness, worse than the illness. Right? So, so I think that means that the, the kind of way we're living at the moment, what, what, what tools do we have? Well, herd immunity, but that's a bit scary. So, therefore, the thing we have is that we have to do things differently. And it means the sort of thing that we're doing at the moment. And being able to work remotely is an important part of that. Um, being able to have robots do some of the stuff that people do at the moment, you know, either not necessarily remotely, but there with you, you know, in, I don't know, in the back of a restaurant, for example, it doesn't have to be all people doing the cooking. You know, you can put a robot in the middle and the people can be further apart. Um, so I think, and we're still learning what that's going to be, but I think this whole business of, um, staying safe and doing the kind of distancing thing that we're doing at the moment, um, you know, robots are going to have a place in that. Um, uh, and that's why we need to be on the front foot. It's a low touch economy. Paul, do you want to, you want to pick it up? No, I, 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 I share that view. I think it is very much, it's not a kind of uh, an all or nothing type thing. I think the really exciting stuff is in the same way that I think AI and machine learning can augment us, you know, as human beings and let us, you know, maybe focus on the things that we, we would rather spend more time on uh, and and also let us go beyond what we can currently do. I think the same is the same is true with smart machines. You know, we, we need to decide, you know, how we want to delegate them, what parts of our, our, our lives and our work we would, we would like to, um, to delegate to them, but also where we'd like to work with them, you know, uh, whether that be to keep us safer or whether it be to uh, um, just make life, you know, more, um, you know, enjoyable and rewarding, you know. So I think there are some really important choices in this kind of engineering, this low touch economy, this new state that we're going to settle into to make sure that um, it's it's what we want, you know, and and let's not just kind of fall into it. Let's let's actively get in there and and try and engineer and design it to be uh, uh, to be you know what we want and 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 hopefully you know even better in many ways than what we had before. We haven't had time to talk about it, but there's a big environmental piece as well, which is yeah. equally beneficial, you know, in offshore energy. Well, <clears throat> we need more electrons and less fossil fuels. If you look at what is the cause of, um, you know, cl causing climate change, the, the generating electricity is probably the biggest single one. I think something around about 25% of emissions are to do with that, thereabouts. Um, and so renewable energy is going to be huge. If it's wind, if it's, if it's uh, at sea, it's in hostile places because that's where the energy is that we want to get out and therefore you know for safety reasons if nothing else having more sophisticated robotic systems remote systems um is key to, is key to that so it on for, for not just low touch economy also for environmental reasons if we want to keep living the way we live as societies this is going to be important to get it right yeah, I think it's so important but both the uh, thinking about the users want and how robots can work with users um, rather than instead of them, and as well, uh, their ability to solve some of the global challenges that we're facing. That's yep. a very positive way to wrap up. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Sabine, for your, for um, helping uh, steer this. And um, it's been uh, great talking with you, David.
Anthony. Yeah, yeah cool. I'm sure we'll be doing it again very soon. <laughs> this yeah. afternoon, in fact, we're going to be doing it. All three of us are going to be doing this again this afternoon, but on a slightly different sure. topic. So, we're doing plans, if not <laughs> tomorrow, to uh, get all this moving. So, it's, people, it's happening. We're, we're pushing hard to make this happen um, through all our networks, and um, it's an exciting prospect and part of what we think UK can deliver as part of the new normal. Build back better, I believe, is the hashtag. Mm. Hi, everyone. Um, Paul and David and Sabine, thank you so much. Uh, a very enlightening and interesting topic for, for many of us. Some good questions coming through. I was putting stuff on Twitter as you guys were presenting, so hopefully you can take a look at that. Um, for everybody who's listening and watching, um, there is an opportunity to meet the speakers. Um, so Paul, I know you've confirmed, David, hopefully you're gonna stay on. So we'll manage that through the production. So anybody who wants to meet David and Paul and, and Sabine as well, I know the three of you are going to be back later on today. Um, for everybody else, this is going to end our first session. Our next next generation infrastructure and cloud services session um, will kick off at around 12 noon. So I will be back for that. Uh, the topic is two years of digital transformation in two months. So you heard me speak in my opening about hyper acceleration. Um, we've got three terrific leaders from Microsoft who are coming in uh, to speak about the acceleration of digital transformation. And as I mentioned earlier, Microsoft is a sponsor, is the lead sponsor for COGX 2020. So great to have you back then. So to everyone, thank you very much. Enjoy meeting the speakers. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.